Hebrews chapter number 11. We're going to look at one small verse. Hebrews 11 and verse 30. We'll, we'll turn to another passage of Scripture for a lot of the message, but Hebrews 11.30 is the text verse. And uh, I've been preaching to you a little bit here and there about faith. As the Lord lays on my heart, He has laid on my heart recently to preach about faith. And I do believe that it is something that we need to grow in. And it's probably just that your pastor needs to grow in it, and so you get the collateral damage, okay? But uh, as I'm thinking about and praying about uh, faith and how we need to act in faith, these verses continue to come to my mind. And Hebrews 11.30 is one of those, just a very simple verse where it says, By faith the walls of Jericho fell down after they were compassed about seven days. Boy, what a small verse that covers such an amazing miracle. What an amazing thing that God did when the walls of Jericho fell. And God, in the book of Hebrews, in chapter number 11, the Hall of Fame of Faith, gives us one verse about it. That's how easy it was for God. That's how little it meant to Him as far as what it was in His expending energy or effort. It was something that He easily did, and it was accomplished by the faith of His people. By faith, those walls fell. We're going to talk about that. I would encourage you even right now to turn to Joshua chapter number 6, and that's where we find the narrative of what went on when the walls of Jericho fell. So Joshua chapter number 6 is where we're going to turn, and we'll look at that in a moment. But I want to remind you, of course, that the book of Joshua was written uh, to tell us the story of what happened after the children of Israel had come out of Egypt, they had spent about 40 years or so with Moses in the wilderness, and Moses was not allowed to enter into the promised land, and neither were they in the beginning because of their unbelief. And so 40 years later, Moses dies, and God enabled Joshua to be the one to lead the children of Israel across the Jordan and into the promised land. And the first obstacle they encounter is a great city, called Jericho. And Joshua 6 will tell us all about that. Let's, let's look at the first verse. We'll read it, we'll pray, and we'll get right into it and we'll go through it. Joshua 6 and verse 1, now Jericho was straightly shut up because of the children of Israel. None went out and none came in. Let's pray. Father, would you help and enable me as I preach your word? Lord, thank you for the Bible. Thank you that we have it in our hands and we can say, thus saith the Lord, that every word is true. We know that this is not just a, an allegory. It's not a fable. Lord, we know and we confess that it is not just approximately what happened, but this is real. And that every word was penned by a human author, but as they were inspired by you to write that. So Lord, help us to have faith in what your word says and to take you at your word and to learn from it, I pray. Give me the words to say. Give all of us ears to hear. In Jesus' name, amen. The first verse tells us a very important part of this narrative of what went on, uh, that the Bible says Jericho was straightly shut up because of the children of Israel. None went out and none came in. Now that might seem like a very simple verse and not that important, but I want you to understand what that meant. This great city of Jericho, most of the time, when they weren't under attack from an, another force, would be a city where, okay, it would have walls and it would have gates, but most of the time, the gates would be open and they would allow commerce in and out of the city based on the security that they had and that would be normally Jericho's situation. Again, Jericho is just, a, I believe it's about five miles. It could be a little more than that, but I think it's about five miles west of the Jordan River just into the Promised Land. And here's this great city that had a king and it had an army and it had a, a, a huge uh, set of walls around it. And normally it's open, but because of the children of Israel crossing into the Promised Land and the news of the children of Israel and what they had done on the east side of Jordan, Jericho was straightly shut up. In other words, all the gates were closed. Those who were the military men were on the watchtower watching and they were careful and the commerce had ceased and it was, it was in a state of being protected. And what an amazing sight it would have been to see that great city with huge walls. 
They tell us that the walls were so big that they actually built houses into the walls. Some people will say that they could even uh, ride a couple of chariots around the walls on top. There was a flat space where the soldiers could go back and forth and they could actually have chariots and multiple chariots on that wall. That's what I've heard. Can't guarantee that that was the case. But we do know from Scripture that it was big enough that houses were built into the walls. And here's this city that's all straightly shut up and closed up. I would say this, as we go through, I want to give you seven parts of the story here. First of all, there was a fortified city, and that would have been intimidating. Can I tell it to you this way? It was impossible for the children of Israel to overcome that. It was impossible for them to overcome that. All right, here's this ragtag army that's been in the wilderness for 40 years. What are they going to do to overcome a walled city? They have no, uh, no homeland to go back to to build uh, engines that would uh, allow them to shoot or catapult things over or whatever. Listen, they are just an army of people who have been nomads in the wilderness for 40 years. They have no wealth to speak of. What are they going to do? It was impossible. It was a fortified city. Look at verse number 2, though, because God is going to give them a great promise. And the Lord said unto Joshua, See, I have given into thine hand Jericho and the king thereof, and the mighty men of valor. Verse 2, God gives them a statement of promise. How does God look at the city? Well, the Bible says, he says, I have given into thine hand Jericho and the king thereof, and the mighty men of valor. God saw it as if the victory had already been won. Do you think that's how Joshua saw it? Do you think that's how the children of Israel saw it? I guarantee you they didn't. As they crossed the Jordan and looked at that great city, I would imagine that inside, when they were in their tents at night, and husbands and wives were whispering in bed together and talking about what was going to happen, I imagine that they said, I have no idea how we're ever going to conquer that city. God says we're going to be able to do it, and God said he's going to give us the victory, but I have no idea how it's going to be done. That city is a fortified city. And if they don't come out to battle against us, how are we ever going to defeat them? We can never breach those walls. We'll never take that. Maybe God will just want us to go around the city. Maybe God has another plan. But that's not how God saw it. God gave them a statement of promise. He said to Joshua, I have given into thine hand Jericho. It is a done deal. Which leads us now to verses 3 through 5. After God gave them that promise, he gives them a command. Verses 3 through 5. And ye shall compass the city, all ye men of war, and go round about the city once. Thus shalt thou do six days. And seven priests shall bear before the ark seven trumpets of ram's horns. And the seventh day ye shall compass the city seven times, and the priests shall blow with the trumpets. And it shall come to pass that when they make a long blast with the ram's horn, and when ye hear the sound of the trumpet, all the people shall shout with a great shout, and the wall of the city shall fall down flat, and the people shall ascend up every man straight before him. So God gives him a command. And here's what God says. You're going to get everybody, all the men of war and the priests, and you're going to take the Ark of the Covenant, which represented God's presence. And you're going to have some soldiers in the front, and you're going to have some people with trumpets after them, and then you're going to have the Ark of the Lord, and then you're going to have some soldiers in the back, and here's what you're going to have them do. You're going to have them march around the city one time every day for six days. And then on the seventh day, you're going to do something a little bit different. Instead of going around one time, you're going to go around seven times. And after you've gone around seven times on that last day, here's what you're going to do. You're going to have those men with the trumpets. You're going to have them blow the trumpets. And I, God, am going to make the walls come down. Now imagine again, if you were part of that army, if you were Joshua, what you're thinking. Now they had seen God perform miracles before. God had always provided for them. God had allowed them to defeat Og and Bashan. You remember that? Or Og, king of Bashan, I should say. And uh, there was another king that God had allowed them to destroy. And all of that, they had, they had seen those great uh, things happen. But this is crazy. You mean that we're going to march around the city 
and somehow when we blow the trumpet, that's going to make the walls come down. I want to point out to you that it was very foolish and incompetent of a way to defeat a city in man's eyes. I don't know of any manual from the military that would tell you that this is a great tactic of a way to overcome a walled city. It doesn't exist. It was foolish and not possibly competent enough, not sufficient in man's eyes, but that was the instruction that God gave. But here's what I want you to see in verses 6 and 7. Not only did God give them or show them a fortified city, and God gave them a statement of promise and a command, but we see in verses 6 and 7 that they had an obedient leader. Look at verse 6. And Joshua the son of Nun called the priests and said unto them, Take up the Ark of the Covenant and let seven priests bear seven trumpets of ram's horns before the Ark of the Lord. And he said unto the people, Pass on and compass the city, and let him that is armed pass on before the Ark of the Lord. There was an obedient leader. Joshua, when he was given the command to march around the city, again, what do you think he thought? You think that he thought, oh, yeah, why didn't I think of that? I, all this time it was right in front of me, and thank you, God, for pointing out the obvious to me. We just have to march around and march around a bunch of times and then blow the trumpet. Of course, the walls are going to fall. Thank you. I wish I would have you know, taken the vitamins that I was supposed to take for my brain function. No, that's not what Joshua thought in his mind. And again, we're reading into it a little bit. Forgive me for that. But he was a human being like you and me. I would imagine that it came to his mind, did I hear God right on that? God, are you sure? Did I miss something? That doesn't seem to make sense. But we never find that Joshua complained to God. We don't find that he went to the people and said, listen, I don't know what's going to go on. God said to do this, but we might want to have a plan B just in case this doesn't work. We never have any record of that. Here's what we do have. The record of him getting up and saying, all right, priests, here's what God has told us to do. They had an obedient leader. But I would go even beyond that and say they had an obedient congregation. You see, because it's only so good for the leader to be obedient to God. The congregation has to obey as well. I've mentioned this before. Every once in a while, I'll mention it, and, and my kids will probably laugh as I do, but one of the statements I heard in Bible college over and over and over again, which made good preaching, but it was horrible theology, is everything rises and falls on leadership. And that's not true. Jesus Christ was the greatest leader ever to enter human flesh, and his apostles were a complete and total failure. Everything doesn't rise and fall on leadership. Moses was, outside of the Lord Jesus, probably the greatest leader in human history. And how did that go? You see, an obedient leader is important. But beyond an obedient leader, it's required that there would be an obedient congregation. To where when God says do this, that the congregation not just follows the leader blindly into whatever he wants to do. That's never wise. But to recognize God's plan and say, I may not understand this, but I'm going to obey God. And that's what they have here. Look with me, if you would, at verse 8. And it came to pass when Joshua had spoken unto the people that the seven priests bearing the seven trumpets of ram's horns passed on before the Lord and blew with the trumpets and the ark of the covenant of the Lord followed them. And the armed men went before the priests that blew with the trumpets and the rearward came after the ark, the priests going on and blowing with the trumpets. And Joshua had commanded the people saying, ye shall not shout nor make any noise with your voice, neither shall any word proceed out of your mouth until the day I bid you shout, then shall ye shout." Let me stop right there and ask you this question. When did God tell him to say that? That's not part of God's command. And yet they obeyed. Why do you think that Joshua commanded them that? Was it that Joshua was a dictator who liked to control people's lives? I doubt it. Now he's a human being. He had failures like all of us do. Here's my opinion on why he included that. Because God had told him there is a time and a place 
You're going to march around, and at this point, you're going to blow the trumpets. That was an important command. If they disobeyed that command, they would be disobeying God. And so here's what Joshua did. Here's the cliff, okay? And Joshua said, I tell you what, so that we don't go over this cliff, I'm going to give you an extra rule. Don't make a sound. Don't talk. It's like a good father who recognizes the fact that, you know, I don't want my kids playing in the street. And so I'm not going to let my kids play at the curb. The boundary where they can go to is not the curb. All right, see where that cement starts and it curves off into the road? You can play right up to there, but if you ever touch that curb, you're in trouble. That's a bad dad. A good dad says, no, no, we're not even going to get close to the curb. You're going to stay at the midpoint, whatever, of the front yard, or I'm going to put a fence up or something. Why? Is it because if I cross that fence or if I go past the midway, uh, then a car's going to hit me and I'm going to die? Probably not. But I don't even want you to get close to the road, therefore I'm going to set the boundary a little early. I believe that's what Joshua is doing. I believe that he's trying to set the people up for, let's make sure we obey, so let's set the rules right here. By the way, that's a good thing. Fathers, it's okay to do that with your families. It's okay for you to say, listen, God never says, thou shalt not whatever. There's no command in Scripture that says you cannot do X. But because I love you, children, I'm going to tell you in our household, while you're living in my household, here is what we're going to do. We're not going to get anywhere close to breaking God's commandments. We're going to have some standards that are set over here. Now, I'm not going to lie to you and tell you that our standards are God's rules. We're not going to lift up the commandments of men as if they were the same as the commandments of God. No, 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 no. These aren't the commandments of God. But I'm your father, and I love you, and I'm going to set some rules for you, and here's what they're going to be. That's a good leader. I believe that's what Joshua is doing. Look with me, if you would, at verse 11. So the ark of the Lord compassed the city, going about at once, and they came into the camp and lodged in the camp. And Joshua rose early in the morning, and the priests took up the ark of the Lord. And seven priests, bearing seven trumpets of ram's horns, before the ark of the Lord went on continually and blew with the trumpets. And the armed men went before them, but the rearward came after the ark of the Lord, the priests going on and blowing with the trumpets. And the second day they compassed the city once and returned into the camp, so they did six days. And it came to pass on the seventh day, that they rose early about the dawning of the day and compassed the city after the same manner seven times. Only on that day they compassed the city seven times. We not only have a fortified city and a statement of promise, a command given, an obedient leader, but we have an obedient congregation, even following commands that are just man-made commands so that everyone does right. Well, guess what we find next then? Verse 16. And it came to pass at the seventh time, when the priest blew with the trumpets, Joshua said unto the people, Shout, and then please read the last part of the verse with me, For the Lord hath given you the city. Now at this point, they've compassed the city, if my math is right, here we go, 13 times. They're about to blow with the trumpets, and Joshua says, God's done it, he's given you the city. Now, were the walls flat at that moment? The walls are still, they look just like they did before. I don't believe the cartoons you watch. I don't think that as they marched around, they were stomping their feet and cracks in the walls came up. Okay, I don't, I don't find that anywhere in Scripture that that happened. I think the city looked just like it did before they marched around the first time. But Joshua gave them a faith-filled declaration. He, based on God's word, looked at the situation that was impossible and said, all right, we did exactly what God said, we obeyed, and now God's going to come through on his end. He's going to do what he promised he would do. And so now's the time, blow the trumpets and then shout, because God has given you the city. There was a faith-filled declaration. And then look with me, if you would, at verse number 20. So he gives them some more commands about Rahab the harlot and that they're not to take of the accursed thing. But look at verse 20. So the people shouted when the priests blew with the trumpets, and it came to pass when the people heard the sound of the trumpet and the people shouted with a great shout that the wall fell down flat so that the people went up into the city, every man straight before him, and they took the city. I would title verse 20, A Miraculous Victory. Now, 
It's tempting for you and me to think to ourselves, okay, so I know what happened. As they marched around, again, there was a certain rhythm to their march that was the perfect resonance to make the foundation of the wall shaky. And there were probably these hairline cracks that started to form. And then the seventh day when they did it, you know, seven times, that really did it. And then as they shouted, that shout was the perfect pitch to cause everything like a, a soprano who sings a high note and breaks the, the, the glass, right? That, that was the perfect resonance then that it broke the walls. Here's the problem. Number one, you're taking the credit away from God. Friends, this was not a... a fulfillment of natural laws. This was God performing a miracle. The other thing about it is the Bible is clear that the walls fell down flat. That wouldn't have happened if it was just the perfect resonance. This was God doing it. I have no idea how. I do know that God has many angels who do his bidding. And I also know that God created the worlds with his word. So he can do whatever he wants, but however he did it, God performed a miracle and they saw the walls go down flat and they went up into the city, the Bible says. I want to encourage you that this happened because they were obedient. And so the title of the message is Faith, the Key to Conquering. Faith, the Key to Conquering. We've gone through Joshua 6 and we've seen how God did it, but let me share with you, if you would, Five important lessons to learn from the narrative here of uh, Joshua and the city of Jericho. Five lessons to learn, and these will be fairly quick. Number one, God sometimes calls us to do the impossible. God sometimes calls us to do the impossible. That's certainly what the situation there. That, number, that, that first verse there, verse number one, tells us that the city was straightly shut up. That... That's, a, again, kind of an insignificant verse in our eyes, but it's very important. It shows the impossibility of them overcoming that city. The city was sealed. There was no way in or out. It was a great and a walled city with a king and an army. And they were a ragtag bunch of people who had no real military skill. They weren't going to be able to do it. It was impossible. And sometimes God calls on us to do the impossible. Now, Sub-point number one under this lesson is, much of the Christian life is mundane. And I want to emphasize that to you this morning because it's important for you and me to remember, much of the Christian life is mundane. Those of you who are married, do you remember what it was like when you were first married? Oh, it's exciting. Oh, it's fun. You have the wedding vows on your wedding day, you ride off together or drive off together for the first time. Boy, it's wonderful. You have the, the honeymoon place all set up, and there you are, and you're together all the time for that week or however long it is. And uh, boy, it's wonderful and exciting. And then, you know, the honeymoon goes much too quickly, doesn't it? And then you have to go back, and usually both are going back to work. And then, you know, after a while, there's still some excitement. There's new things. There's your first Thanksgiving together and your first Christmas together and birthdays and maybe the birth of a baby and all of that. But you know what happens after a little while? Any of you who have been married any length of time, you know it becomes mundane. You know what marriage is after just a few years? It's just life. It's day after day, getting up, doing the things you're supposed to do, setting yourself aside and loving the other person. If kids are involved, it's setting yourself and your needs aside and caring for children. And day after day, moment after moment, a holiday after holiday, birthday after birthday, it's mundane. You know that the Christian life is much like that. So much of the Christian life and success in the Christian life is not found in the Jericho moments. Success in the Christian life, the majority of it is found in the day after day plodding along, and listen, when you don't feel like it, doing what you're supposed to do. The ministry that God has given you to, to take the uh, counsel of Paul to Archippus when he said, take heed to the ministry which thou hast received in the Lord, that thou fulfill it. Just day after day, doing what you're supposed to do, that's where the majority of victory in the Christian life is found. 
And let me ask you this question, are you doing the mundane? Are you fulfilling your duty? Or are you looking for the next exciting thing? That's good. Nothing wrong with exciting times. But that's not where real Christian victory is found. We need to obey in those mundane things. However, sometimes God does call us to step out by faith and do the impossible. Sometimes that's the way it is. Here's the thing I would point out to you. You and I don't get to decide when and what th things those are. The children of Israel didn't pick Jericho and say, all right, God, we're coming into the promised land. We crossed the Jordan. All right, which one do we want? Okay, well, Ai is over there, but that's a little city. I know, Jericho, the big one. That's it. They didn't get to do that. They walked over across the Jordan. God gave them a dry crossing. And as they crossed over, God said, there it is right there. That's what I want you to overtake. And I would imagine that a lot of them went, really? That's a big one, God. I don't know. They didn't get to choose. And friends, you and I don't get to choose either. Sometimes God will say, nope, your job is the mundane. You don't get a Jericho moment right now. Somebody else will, and somebody else gets to walk by faith in that area. But you, you're just going to plot along. You're going to do the usual. You're going to go day after day, moment after moment, do what is normal. No one will notice you, but I'm watching. You and I don't get to choose. But God sometimes calls us to do the impossible. Second lesson that we can learn from this is God calls those things that be not as though they were. Remember that God said to, to Joshua, I've given you Jericho? Turn with me, if you would, to Romans 4. That's a principle that we find in, throughout the Bible, but it's stated clearly in Romans 4. One of the verses that I love to quote regarding this is Romans 4 and verse 17. Now, the context in Romans 4 is about Abraham and how God called him the father of many nations, even though he did not have any children and wouldn't for a long time. Romans 4 and verse 17. As it is written, I have made thee a father of many nations, before him whom he believed, even God, who quickeneth the dead, that means he makes them alive, and calleth those things which be not as though they were. God calls those things that be not as though they were. I would put it to you this way, God sees the end from the beginning because he is eternal. God is eternal, that means he exists at every point in history and in the future. He is eternal. There is no time with him, per se. He is an eternal being. So he sees the end from the beginning. When he stated to Joshua, I've given you Jericho, God was existing at that point in the days ahead when J Jericho had already fallen. And the children of Israel were occupying that. And they lived in the houses where the people of Jericho had lived before. God was there. And God was in this day now looking at Jericho where it is now because God is eternal. Those things that God has ordained but are not yet accomplished, He sees as already done. You and I struggle because we believe what our senses are saying rather than God's Word. We believe what our senses are telling us. In other words, what we see, what we hear, what we taste, etc. But listen, even beyond that, what we have experienced in the past. If we were there at that point, here's what we would think. I've never seen walls like that fall. I've never seen those things overcome. I don't know how God's going to do it. And I don't know if he can do it. He says he's already done it, but I've never seen that happen. And we struggle with that. And so here's what we have to do. We have to grab a hold of, by faith, what God has said and take God at His word. That's really what faith is, is to say, if God says the city belongs to us, then I'm going to rename Jericho Weissville. Because God says, I, that's mine. And so I'm going to take God at His word. He said, I've already given, you, given it to you, so if it belongs to me, I can rename it. See, we have to take God at his word. Point number three, or lesson number three, is God's ways of fulfilling his purpose are often foolish and incompetent in man's eyes. God's ways of fulfilling his purpose are often foolish and incompetent. When God wants something done that we look at as impossible, God may call on us to do things 
to accomplish that goal that we think, ah, that's not going to be nearly enough. There's no way. Walking around that city is not going to overcome those walls. I've walked a lot, and I've never seen walls fall based on my walking. It's not going to happen. We're going to need something else. Joshua, you better go back to the drawing board. I have heard that they have these machines that you can build that will throw large stones against a wall. And, or I've heard that if you build a ladder long enough, you can prop it up against, and maybe we could sneak in at night or whatever. Uh, Joshua, I think you need to go back to the drawing board. Certainly there is some way we can do this that makes sense. But God's ways of fulfilling his purpose are often foolish and incompetent in man's eyes. I would remind you, we won't turn there for time's sake, but 1 Corinthians 1, verses 18 to 25, talks about the fact that the things that are foolishness with men, uh, God, I'm sorry, God's wisdom is often foolishness with men. And God has chosen by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. The fourth lesson that we can learn is that God responds to faith. God responds to faith. We remember from Hebrews 11 and verse 6, But without faith it is impossible to please Him. For he that cometh to God must believe that He is, and that He is a rewarder of them that diligently seek Him. God responds to faith. And faith is taking God at His word. Faith is taking God at His word. If God says the city belongs to me, then it's mine. Look with me, if you would, at Numbers chapter 14. Joshua was alive when the events of Numbers 14 happened. Joshua would remember this. Perhaps Joshua was even with Moses when God spoke to Moses in this regard in Numbers 14. Now, as you're turning to Numbers 14, we're going to jump in in verse 11. And this is right after the children of Israel sent spies into the promised land. And 12 spies were sent... Ten of them came back with an evil report. And they said, man, there's giants in the land. There's fortified cities. Maybe they even saw Jericho. And they said, we can't overcome those fortified cities. And those giants, they're so big, we look like grasshoppers to them. There's no way. We can't do it. Two of the spies, Caleb and a guy named Joshua, came back with a report and said, God is able. Yeah, there's giants. But God is able. God said we can take it, we can take it. But the children of Israel believed the ten spies. Again, good leadership doesn't always mean obedient congregation. The congregation believed the ten evil spies, and they said, we're not going, and God was angry. Look at Numbers 14, verse 11. And the Lord said unto Moses, How long will this people provoke me, and how long will it be ere they believe me? For all the signs which I have showed among them, I will smite them with the pestilence and disinherit them and will make of thee a greater nation and mightier than they. Now, by the way, Moses interceded for them and God forgave them and did not destroy them. But what I want to point out to you is this, a lack of faith provokes God. A lack of faith provokes God. We have somebody much better than Moses interceding on our behalf. His name is Jesus Christ. He is at the right hand of the Father, interceding on our behalf right now. But listen, I don't want him to have to intercede on my behalf because of my unbelief. Because I provoked God because he called me to do on something, that, or called on me to do something that was impossible. And I said, no, God, I, I can't believe you. I don't believe you'll really do it. And perhaps if I do, God would say to me, as he said to Moses, how long will it be ere you believe me? Look at all the things I've done. Look at the word I've given you, and you still won't believe me? When will you stop provoking me to anger? God responds to faith, and a lack of faith grieves God. In fact, turn with me, if you would, to John chapter 3. Though most in here, I would imagine, are born-again Christians. Perhaps there's some who are not. But John 3 is what we're going to turn to. Whether you are a born-again Christian or not, it is important to understand how big of a situation and an issue faith is, because a lack of faith prevents salvation. Let me say that again. A lack of faith prevents salvation. So, here's something that's important for us to understand. One person committing murder doesn't prevent them from getting saved. A person committing adultery doesn't prevent them from getting saved. A person who commits homosexuality 
that does not prevent them from getting saved. There's one thing that prevents a person from getting saved, and that is unbelief. Unbelief is the issue. And God hates those sins. They are an abomination before Him. He despises them, and He's going to deal with them. But the issue with any person who is unsaved is not the sin they've committed in and of itself. It's their unbelief in what God provided for salvation. John 3, look at verse 16. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. Jump down to verse 18. He that believeth on Him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. You see, what's the issue? The issue of condemnation is that he hasn't believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. In other words, God's way of salvation. Jump down to verse 36. This later is John the Baptist speaking, and he says, He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life, and he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. What is the issue? The issue is unbelief. Faith is so important that when we lack it, number one, if we lack salvation regarding Jesus being God's answer to our sin, then we can't be saved. You cannot be saved if you will not believe that Jesus is God's answer for your sin. You cannot be saved. I don't care how Baptist you are. I don't care how many times you've been baptized. I don't care how much money you give to the church or how religious you are or how many times you go through the sacraments. If you do not believe on Jesus Christ and what he did for you, that that is my only need for salvation, then you cannot be saved. But for those of us who have believed on Jesus, faith is so important that when we don't believe God, it provokes Him to anger. It's like somebody coming along and poking you, flicking your ear, provoking you. That's what we do when we don't believe God. Now again, we have Jesus interceding on our behalf, but I don't want to provoke God. But my unbelief does. Let's look at one more lesson. Faith gives birth to obedience. Faith gives birth to obedience. When the children of Israel believed God regarding Jericho, what did they do? They obeyed. And they even obeyed some commands that weren't necessarily from God, but they were their leader said, hey, we're going to do this. It'll help us to obey what God actually did. And so they just followed and obeyed. Why? Because they believed God. And when you and I believe, it will result in obedience. James chapter number 2, we'll close with this. Right after Hebrews is James. James 2 and verse 14. James 2 and verse 14. What doth it profit, my brethren, though a man say he hath faith and have not works? Can faith save him? If a brother or sister be naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you say unto them, Depart in peace, be ye warmed and filled, notwithstanding ye give them not those things which are needful to the body, what doth it profit? Even so, faith, if it hath not works, is dead, being alone. Yea, a man may say, Thou hast faith, and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works, and I will show thee my faith by my works. Thou believest that there is one God, thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble. But wilt thou know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead? You see, just as a body without the Spirit is dead, Faith without works is dead. My body is able to do all kinds of things. Some of them good, some of them bad, but all kinds of amazing things. Think about it, the eyes and how they see things and the mouth and how it speaks and all of the different functions of the body that your body and my body are doing right now without us even thinking. But here's one thing that will cause that to cease and that is take the spirit away and you can have all the bodies here you want and not a one of those things will happen. Because without the Spirit, the body's dead. See, we can say we have faith, but if there's no works behind it, you know what it tells us about our faith? It's not real faith. It's just a dead shell. It's just words. Because real faith always obeys. You can't separate the two. It's not real faith if it's not obeying. 
Because real faith by nature takes God at his word, and when you take God at his word, you follow through on what he says. It's a great lesson for you and me to learn. Faith is the key to conquering. It may be that God would have us do something that seems impossible. And all we have to do, friends, is just obey. Believe him and obey. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the time that we've had looking at your word and studying these things. Would you work now in this time of invitation? Lord, I pray that you would call on all of us to obey you, to believe you, and to follow what you've told us to do, I pray. Lord, if there's anyone within the sound of my voice that has yet to believe on Jesus Christ as their personal Savior, as the answer for their sin problem, Lord, I pray that you would please enable them to believe the gospel, to be convicted of their sin, and to believe on Jesus Christ as your answer for their sin. Please, would you help? Give understanding, give wisdom. In Jesus' name, amen.